people ask me, you know, Chris, what are you doing to excite the next generation about the guitar? And you know, we're a small company. It's a big world, so we have a limited budget. But we're very fortunate, I think, because Martin guitars have, since 1833, been so much a part of modern music, whether it was modern music in the 1800s or the 1900s or now the 21st century. I have met younger players who are very excited about playing the guitar, learning how to play the guitar, and learning about the music. And that's when I begin to say to myself, okay, we're probably more fortunate than anybody else in this business because if they have a curiosity about where the music came from and they begin to do some research and they look at their current guitar heroes and they read a review by someone who is popular today and that person says, well, when I was younger, one of my influences was Bob Dylan. And this young player says, hmm, Bob Dylan, I've heard of him. Let me go do some research on who Bob Dylan is. So they go and they find an interview that Bob Dylan gave. And Bob Dylan says, well, when I was younger, one of my influences was Woody Guthrie. And so they go, hmm, I wonder who Woody Guthrie is. Let me go find out who Woody Guthrie is. And they go, and every time they encounter these people, if they're curious and astute, they're going to notice that they happen to be playing Martin guitars. My name is Dick Boak and welcome to Martin. We're down in the sawmill. Uh, this is the rough uh, production area where the raw lumber would come in and get processed. We try to stay at least a year ahead of our production and that's why there's so much lumber here. And uh, in back of me is genuine mahogany and, and Spanish cedar that we use for our neck stock. Uh, these will be cut into parallelograms that you can see over here. Um, the parallelograms are then marked out using the uh, templates, and these will be bandsawed in, into uh, what we call neck billets. Wood often comes to us at about 30% moisture content. And what we do is we air dry it for a period of time and then, and then bring it uh, down to about, oh, 20% uh, moisture content through air drying, at which point it would go into the kiln and very, very carefully the moisture content is brought down to a stable range of about 10%. And then it'll come out of the kiln and back into the acclimating room where, where it is air seasoned to about 6%. And 6% is uh, where we want it in order to uh, start work uh, on a guitar. 6% is about as dry as, as you'd, ha you'd find in the United States. 
Uh, we want a situation where a guitar would bring on moisture, not give it off. Uh, when when uh, wood gives off moisture, it's prone to cracking. Uh, when, when it takes on moisture, it, it kind of stabilizes in the environment that it's intended to, to be used in. So the green machine that you're seeing is, uh, is called a resaw unit. We've got a couple of them. And what we do with the resaw units is, is run uh, mahogany lumber, uh, specially selected uh, quarter sawn mahogany lumber, through, the, through these machines in order to cut them into guitar sets. This is what we would call a, a flitch. And a flitch is a successive uh, cutting of, of several pieces of wood. Um, and they're cut in pairs. So the pairs would be perfect book matches. From these book matches, we would mark out for guitar sets, either sides or backs. Now we're in the acclimating room. Um, uh, this room was built about a decade ago. And the problem that we had in, in our production was that we had pallets of raw wood sitting all over the plant, uh, taking up space that could have been used to make guitars. And it, w it became increasingly a, a, a problem as our production grew. And so this room was built. And as you can see, um, we can store a tremendous amount of wood in here and this environment is kept to a very, very tight temperature and humidity setting. It's, a, it's not unusual for the wood to sit here for, uh, you know, a year or more before we would be ready to use it. Rosewood is usually wrapped in burlap uh, to keep the moisture in, to keep it from drying out. And it has wax tans uh, in, and comes in bookmatched sets from India. And as you can see, we, we, we have uh, quite a lot of rosewood here. Uh, once again, we're trying to, to make sure that we don't get caught without, without the wood. Uh, we usually have about a year's supply, at least, of Indian rosewood. Some of our woods are so valuable that we need to keep them locked in a cage. Uh, uh, this is where we keep the Brazilian rosewood, the flamed mahogany, quilted mahogany. Uh, the the uh, flamed co wood sets, they're just so, they're so valuable and so precious that they need to be locked up. Um, a lot of these woods we can get only uh, at certain times, and some, some of the woods, like Brazilian rosewood, we can't get at all. All of our spruce tops are hand split and perfectly quarter sawn. Uh, it's really uh, critical to the stability and the tone of the guitars. This is Italian alpine spruce. And uh, uh, we refer to it sometimes as Stradivari spruce. Um, it's, it's, it's a beautiful spruce. And we're getting ready to make a limited edition for Robbie Robertson, as well as the Kingston Trio 50th anniversary commemorative. Okay. So this is one of our CNC machines. Uh, these machines are cutting 12 necks at a time and then exchanging with 12 more necks. Uh, the idea here is that, that uh, if we digitize a neck that has been hand-shaped, we can recreate it over and over again with tremendous accuracy, and uh, that's what we're doing. It does a beautiful job. Okay, this tool is called the Micron, and this is a, a, a very miniature high-speed router that is cutting the fret slots as well as the uh, inlay areas on our fingerboards. The nice thing about the Micron is that it, it can dive in and cut a slot that is called a pocketed fret, uh, leaving a clean edge on the edge of the fingerboard, as you can see. Uh, this is really a, a tremendous improvement over the old method, which was to cut the slot all the way through and then have to deal with an open fret end. This is kind of like having a bound fingerboard. So this CNC machine in back of me is set up to cut 
front blocks, either the mortise and tenon block or the dovetail block that we use to uh, join the sides together. Serial number would usually appear here. The CNC machine is just an ideal tool for repetitive machining like this. And over here, this machine is cut up to uh, put the crowning and the taper on all of our fingerboards. It's also uh, drilling the holes for the, the mother of pearl position dots. So here they're putting in rosettes. So after the top and back, are, or the top is joined on the uh, clamp carrier, everything uh, is sanded smooth, and then it comes over here. And then they'll cut the channels in on the machine, then they hand install every rosette. The hard part is keeping, keeping them in sequence. <laughs> This light, it's called candling, something like this, where they'll find a knot or a pocket that's hidden. Without the light, you can't really see it. Once you get it into the light, you can see the, the variations in the wood grain. Now, not all of those things are defects, but they are characteristics and they affect the grading of the top. This is the matching station where the book matches of East Indian Rosewood and this is a pair of sides are matched up with an appropriate colored back. These guitars are pretty precious and we want the back and side material to, to uh, be a very, very good match for color and grain. So this glue wheel was put into use sometime around the turn of the century, uh, we think around 1902. Uh, the legend is that, that uh, Frank Henry Martin, C.F. Martin III's father, found it uh, in a railroad yard that it was part of an old railroad switch. But it was modified to uh, be a, a consecutive glue wheel. And the idea is that a worker can work repeatedly in a circle and by the time she gets around one revolution the glue is dry and she can work continuously gluing up tops and bags. So there's lateral pressure as well as downward pressure. So this is our new laser machine. And this is also an exchanger where uh, two backs can be done at a time. And here, the backs are held down by a vacuum. And then the perimeter cut, which is slightly oversized, is cut out using a very high intensity laser that gives us a perfect cut. So the laminate material for the X-Series guitars is called high-pressure laminate, and uh, we hate to use the uh, Formica word, but it's very much like Formica, uh, very high-quality laminate, and comes in a variety of figured wood finishes, and we're cutting this material here uh, on a uh, multi-cam machine that's an overhead CNC router. It's a little quieter and more relaxing up here. Now all the, all the wood processing has been done downstairs and the materials are being brought upstairs now. Here we've got a, a, a book matched pair of East Indian rosewood. You can still see a little bit of singeing from the laser cutting uh, uh, to get the profile for the, the top and the back. 
the curved surface being the back, the flat surface being the top. And uh, these book match pairs are going to go into the bending iron and cook for about four to five minutes at about 400 plus degrees. Very quickly, we want to get these materials glued up into a rim. And we have an ingenious fixture to do that. The fixture enables us to work flat with the, the top side down and get the, uh, the two halves of the rim perfectly aligned on center line with their front blocks and their rear blocks. So these uh, traditional hand bending irons are heated with rheostats. In the olden days, uh, they, they actually used coals from the fire and then later on uh, uh, gas. But now we use electricity, of course. The rheostats enable the irons to be heated using a heating element inside a tube get, to get them up to about 400 degrees. and. Uh, Hand bending is done across the irons by rocking the wood and then checking it carefully against a, a template. So the front block is made of genuine mahogany and will eventually be cut into the traditional dovetail. Right now it's just a mortise. Here you can see this is one of the front blocks for the Air Clap Clapton 00-2080C, an extremely popular model. Um, here's one from the Crosby, Stills and Nash model that is in memory of Jerry Tolman, their manager. Uh, all of these blocks, and here's a triple O 42 marquee, all of these blocks are laser burned. So now we have a, complete, a completed rim uh, glued up with its front block and its rear block. Both blocks have a slight contour on them to match the contour of the guitar. And like I said, the dovetail will be now uh, cut and exposed. The trick with bracing is to have just enough to support the extreme amount of tension that's pulling on the top, trying to cave the guitar in half. The uh, guitar is very weak at the sound hole, and that's why the Martin X bracing pattern is so successful, because it uses a scissors brace that distributes all of the pressure pulling on the top onto the shoulders of the guitar without jeopardizing the sound hole area, which, I, as I said, is very weak. So the trick is to have just, just the right amount of bracing, not too much. Too much bracing, uh, actually very common on other brands of guitars. Heavy bracing produces a very dead, dull tonality. Bracing that is too light would jeopardize the uh, strength and longevity of the, of the top. So Martin Bracing walks that line between strength and tone. Uh, it's light and hand scalloped, uh, scalloping referring to these concave cuts in the braces which liven up a top. Uh, the bridge plate supports the bridge area. Uh, but, but like I said, the intention here is to uh, Walk the borderline between strength and tone. So this is uh, the ribbon lining. It's made from Spanish cedar. It has uh, kind of a cigar box or a pencil sharpener odor to it. It's what gives the guitar uh, 
the wonderful odor that comes out of the sound hole. Um, it's very difficult to make this part. Uh, these saw cuts have to be made so that they almost go through, but not quite. That's what enables the piece to bend. Um, and the, the lining is uh, one of the most critical parts of the guitar in respect to the transference of tone from the vibrations of the top through the sides and into the back. Uh, without the ribbon lining, we would have no surface upon which to glue the top and the back. And it's a, it's a delicate and important piece of the guitar. And uh, Dave, who, who is, you've been here how many years? Since coming here on July 11th, he's 41. 41 years. 41 years for Dave. Great employee, or the, probably the the best ribboner in the world. Uh, you know, th this uh, this job has traditionally been done with clothespins, and and we just haven't found any better way to do the job. So it's kind of old world uh, technology here, but uh, the clothespins uh, set set the ribbon lining in place. Here's an Eric Clapton model. Um, and once the, once the uh, ribbon is, is glued, then the rim is complete, ready for the top and back to be hand fit. So this is an older wooden mold. Uh, uh, we had many hundreds of these uh, dating back into the 1800s. Some of them are in the museum. Some are stored over at North Street, and we still use some of them. This is uh, an orchestra model mold, probably dating back to the 1930s and 40s. So this is one of our modern molds. It, it's a die-cast aluminum mold. It has a certain amount of weight to it, and the weight is purposeful because we want the mold to exert pressure onto the disc sanders that will prepare the surfaces of the top and the back. The top of a Martin guitar is in effect flat uh, from the bottom of the guitar to the waist, and then it dives downhill at about a degree and a half angle to allow for the neck fit. The back of the guitar is arched in two different directions, this way longitudinally and laterally with the curvature of the back braces. And I think this is one of the critical aspects of Martin Tone is the fact that the guitar is sprung or spring-loaded so that when a player plucks a string, it sets everything into motion. The gluing of the top and the back to the rim uh, involve uh, a very careful routing of the ribbon lining to accept the ends of the main structural braces. This ties the guitar beautifully together tonally, uh, enabling the vibrations of the top to merge into the back and sides. So the first thing that is done to the rim is that uh, small router cuts are made into the lining to accept the main structural braces. After which uh, glue is applied, everything is very carefully fit, and the top and back are actually uh, glued on. Once the top and back are in position, the, the assembly of the top and back in the mold are, are put into a, uh, a heated fixture that is actually um, an air bladder. The air is inflated and, ex and exerts just the right amount of pressure to keep the, bat the top and the back glued. And this is a heated form like the bracing platens. The, the heat uh, helps the, the glue cure quickly. We prepare the fingerboards off of the guitar. Uh, they have tooling holes which locate them to the neck assembly. 
and the, the, the frets have been pre-prepared and are pre-crowned and all set to go, tapped lightly into place and then set into place using a uh, arbor press which exerts just the right amount of tension on the fingerboard to seat, seat each fret perfectly. Okay, they're going to take a neck blank, insert the adjustable truss rod, put the fingerboard on that's already been fretted. Uh, the locator points will make sure that's true so the guitar plays in tune. And a glue on the fingerboard, glue on the heel cap, and it goes again in a neck press. So this is called the phrasing department. Phrasing is actually a German word. Uh, uh, we've had trouble finding it in the dictionary, but it, we, we believe it means to trim an edge. Uh, basically what they're doing here is trimming the edges of the, of the top and the back to accept the binding and inlay. The binding is the outer piece. The inlay is usually black, white, or pearl, and it is inset into the binding so that uh, our bindings actually go around the edge, like an L shape. So it's a very delicate cut, enabled by many different uh, little wheels that, that are uh, dimensioned for us. And the, the binding serves the purpose of protecting the edge of the guitar from dents, sealing off the end grain from moisture, and it also provides the primary decoration for each instrument. In the event that we are going to use pearl inlay, we will glue into the binding a piece of Teflon that doesn't adhere to the glue. And the Teflon can then be peeled out of the binding after the fact so that the pearl pieces can be inset. This is a custom guitar that's getting a fairly standard top binding, but it has a pearl rosette and what looks to be a special top. So the binding is uh, set perfectly into place and taped using masking tape and it'll dry overnight before, before it's sanded. It's using a, a file and, and for the waist of the guitar, we use what's called a riffler, a little bent file. We want to get this dimension perfectly before we do the glue up. So that's what's happening here. Well, we found that the masking tape really does a very effective job of, of gluing and clamping the binding uh, uh, while the glue dries. The old method is to wrap the guitar and mummify it, and we still do that on a lot of different models, especially especially cutaway models like this custom guitar. So this is Susan Cummins and she's one of our best neck fitters. She's working on an Eric Clapton Triple O 2080C, one of our most popular models. And the trick here is to first undercut the, uh, uh, the neck so that it adheres to the contour of the body and then by removing very slight amounts of material from both sides of the neck you can throw a neck off center or onto center we want it on center we also have to pitch the neck back and this is what she's doing here she's setting the pitch of the neck back so that the bridge height is exactly right and this is one of the most difficult jobs that we do here If a neck fit is done correctly, theoretically you could
probably string the guitar up without any glue and it would hold. So check it, having checked that, she knows that she needs to throw the neck back just a little bit. Did you need to throw it to one side more than the other? No, actually it was right on. It was right on center. So she's trying to not disturb the center line while setting the pitch back a little bit. And she'll check it a second time or a third time or a fourth time, but she's pretty good at this. So two times and you've got it. <laughs> the difficulty is that there are so many critical surfaces to this dovetail, it's very confusing. Uh, it took me several years to even comprehend what I was doing with the chisel for this job, and I still can't do it very well. So we don't want any wobble in the neck bit at all. Center line, perfect. Neck pitch. We, want, we have several different heights of bridges, but we want to fit the neck here for a medium-sized bridge. Great use for a Kaiser capo to hold the uh, tongue of the fingerboard down. A little more adjustment here. I don't know if you noticed, but she's slipped a little piece of brass that is about the thickness of our lacquer. And that brass is there to give us a little bit of an offset for the heel cap, because the body of the guitar is going to be hand scraped along the binding, which is going to change the dimension. So she's trimmed the heel cap area and using a paring knife, going to match up the uh, heel cap to the back binding perfectly. And the brass, I don't want to get cut here. The little piece of brass will just give us an offset so that the heel cap will match up perfectly with the back binding. After this job is done, the neck and the body are no longer interchangeable. And they're going to be given a, a code number that matches up so that this, this body and this neck only will be uh, paired together after lacquering. Lacquering, of course, happens separately, the neck and body as two pieces. And now the heel cap can be fit and glued. There's enough different uh, aspects to this job that I consider it the hardest job in the plant. That's why we want only the most brilliant and uh, intelligent people working on this. Right? Right. After lacquer, that'll fit perfectly. Now these are going to be separated and sent through lacquering uh, and brought back together at the very end. Thanks. So Susan's grandfather, Earl, Hart Earl Hartzell, photographed here in 1925. He was uh, one of our great workers, and see, he was working on a batch of ukuleles and, and a batch of koa top Hawaiian guitars. <clears throat> we have a lot of situations where uh, uh, fathers and grandfathers and uncles and aunts and sisters and cousins work in the factory. So now that the neck has been fit to the body, the neck will go on and be fine shaped. The final shaping 
the carving of the diamond. With the body, however, the, the uh, areas of uh, binding and, and the lip of the sound hole are going to be fine sanded and prepared for lacquering. Uh, after this job is done, masking tape will be applied to the areas of the body that we don't want lacquer to, to adhere to. For example, the, the patch underneath the bridge, as well as the areas where the neck will be glued in. One of the most beautiful aspects of the guitar, in my opinion, is the uh, diamond volute, or dart, on the back of uh, D28s, D45s. Uh, this does not appear on the D35 or the D18. It's actually a remnant of um, uh, guitars from the 1830s that had a dovetailed headstock. And by that, I mean that the headstock and the neck shaft were two separate pieces of wood that slipped together and had a little byproduct or leftover piece, which was this little dart. When, when we went to uh, using solid mahogany for the necks, uh, we wanted to maintain this feature because it's, a, it's just a beautiful and, and a trademark feature of Martin Guitars. So this feature has to be hand filed and, and carved using paring knives and, and files and scrapers, and that's what's happening here. In the background, you can see the application of the filler, which looks a lot like paint at this point. Uh, it's, got, it's brushed on. It's allowed to dry to a leathery consistency, and then it's forced into the grain using buffing bonnets. Um, the filler will then be wiped clean, leaving a residue in the pores only. And what this does is prevent lacquer from seeping into the guitar like a sponge and provides a very smooth, even surface for, for us to, uh, to build a, a beautiful lacquer finish upon. Uh, one problem with the filler, though, is that it stains the bindings. So after the filler has been applied, the bodies have to come over to this area and be hand scraped back to their clean white color. to do this job with a pretty conventional drill press. Uh, this is the, the drilling of the tuning machines, which is a really critical aspect. Everything has to be just perfect. So now we have a, a, a much better tool, which is an automatic drill, which uh, knows the exact location and, and drills uh, a stepped drill perfectly every time. Now that the guitars have been filled, sealed, drilled for their tuning machines, then the decal logo can go on and uh, the steps of the lacquering process can proceed. So this, uh, I'm really proud of this. This is uh, one of the Eric Clapton prototypes we're making out of Madagascar rosewood. This is the first time I've seen it. It's just beautiful. The Madagascar rosewood looks uh, very much like Brazilian rosewood and has much of the tonal properties that Brazilian is prized for. Uh, so these have been through lacquering, they've been through polishing, and now the uh, fingerboard and, and uh, fingerboard surface is being cleaned and the dovetail area is being re-exposed so that it can be final fit to its body prior to glue up. Also the tuning machines will be installed in this area. This is a lacquering schedule. Uh, the lacquering schedule is very complicated, and we have many different lacquering uh, procedures. But in, in a nutshell, we first are going to apply stain, if there's any staining to be done. 
then a vinyl seal coat, then a filler coat, and then a second vinyl sealer coat to sandwich in the filler. After which we do a light scuffing of the guitar, followed by three coats of lacquer, a sanding, three coats of lacquer, a sanding, final, final touch up with a brush, final spray coats of lacquer, followed by a final sanding and final polishing. It's a very complicated and timely, time consuming process, but it does yield a finish that is probably, arguably, the finest woodworking finish in the world. This guitar has had almost six coats of lacquer on it already, plus the sealer coats. You, you, uh, you can still see a little bit of pores if you look very carefully into the reflection. So this is going into its, uh, I believe, its second sanding, after which it'll be uh, inspected, dropped in with lacquer, and resprayed as necessary to get the, the finish perfectly smooth. So basically, they're building lacquer up, knocking it down, building it up, knocking it down until they have an extremely thin coating of lacquer that is perfectly smooth. We want the lacquer to be thin so that it doesn't interfere with the tone. Guitars that have thick finishes, and that is very commonplace, really inhibit the sound of the instrument. Because we have such a long heritage of hand craftsmanship, we're always a little skeptical of, of new technologies, but where it makes sense um, for, for for a new technology to really work or, or to improve the product. We try to be open-minded and, and uh, this is one of our biggest open-minded projects. Uh, this is uh, the polishing robot and it actually does an incredible job. The problem is that lacquer is, is about twice the thickness of a human hair and when you bear down with a polishing pad onto the surface of the lacquer, it's very easy to burn right through it, right down to the raw wood and require the entire refinishing of the guitar, which is very costly um, and unnecessary. So the nice thing about the robot is that, that uh, we've been able to uh, uh, digitize this process. This is a pressure sensitive uh, uh, wheel that works in, in relation to the robot and exerts the exact, exact right amount of pressure it's a repeatable process over and over again so that we don't run into uh, the problems that we ran into with inconsistency and burn throughs uh, doing this by hand. Uh, so the robot uh, also uh, obeys, obeys us and does what we tell him to do or her. We're not sure if it's a male or a female. The robot helps us get rid of the, or the orange peel or pebbliness to the finish. There's still a considerable amount of hand polishing that needs to be done to achieve the fine gloss using lamb's wool buffing bonnets and a polishing compound. We go over every guitar and just make sure that the finish is perfect. High gloss, no scratches. So this is a pearl inlay department, and uh, um, this is where the, the D41s and the D42s and the D45s and all, a lot of custom pearl inlay is done. Um, it's, a, it's, it's quite a skilled job and quite time consuming. Um, on a D45, the area around the tongue of the fingerboard has to be excavated uh, after the neck is fit. It's, uh, it's, the trough is cut. Pieces are inlaid and mitered. It's, it's, uh, it's a very exacting job. The pearl pieces have some curvature to them, and that makes uh, her job a little easier. Esther's been here for a couple of years. How many years? 34 years. Three years before me. So here the neck and the body have been uh, matched up for a final fit. 
The final fit is also like the rough fit. It's critical to the playability of the guitar. We want a nice, clean uh, glue joint, and we, we, we rely on a perfect pitch of the neck so that the bridge height is exactly right for great playability. This is a fit without glue. After, a, after checking this and making, sh making sure it's perfect, she'll go in and apply glue and do the final glue up. Like so. And this is quite a guitar. This is a, one of the, the Doobie 42s. Doobie Brothers uh, limited edition. Beautiful herringbone pearl around the perimeter of the top. So after the neck has been glued to the body, then the bridge can be glue, uh, glued, located and glued for the first time. That's what's happening here. Using a special gluing call uh, that exerts pressure on the bridge in four spots, the bridge is secured, tightened up and, and allowed to dry. So this is really the last step uh, prior to stringing the guitar up. So we're in the final assembly department here. This is where the guitar is, uh, is strung up. You can see that we have a protective cover to prevent any dents and scratches to the top of the guitar. Um, stringing and also cutting of the, of the uh, slots in the nut to set the, the action uh, of the strings at the nut as well as the action of, of the strings here at the saddle. These are all critical to the, the playability and feel of the guitar. After all this is done, we'll also set the pick guard into place. And, um, and then, it, then the guitar will go into the warehouse for a minimum of eight days, where everything adjusts and settles in. Uh, after which, the guitar is reinspected one more time to knock the action back down and get it perfect, perfect playability so that when it arrives at the store, it's in tune and ready to play. So naturally, in final inspection, we need uh, all of our guitar players in this area. This is where it really counts. So uh, it's a prerequisite. If you want to work back here, you've got to play guitar. But we've got some really good guitar players. George is uh, a student of the blues and a and, uh, great fingerstyle player. I'm fascinated by guitar design. Um, I'm not a good guitar player, which has its pluses and its minuses. On the one hand, I'm not prejudiced about things that guitar players are prejudiced about, but sometimes I also feel like the, the GM executive that has to be chauffeured to work because I don't drive my own car. Um, yes, I find guitar design fascinating. In our case, we have to be very cautious about how we change because part of our success, a great deal of our success, is based on our great tradition and people don't want us to mess with that tradition. So sometimes it's just a question of scarcity of resources and we need to find alternatives or subtle, you know, improvements, modifications. There are, there are structural issues that we've lived with for years that we need to deal with. You know, being in business as long as we have and offering a lifetime guarantee to the original owner means you're going to see problems. And when you see them routinely, 
Shame on you if you don't say, we've got to try and fix this problem without affecting the tone. Because that's, that's really what we sell. We, you know, uh, Mike Longworth, who used to be the company historian, said, he said, we make a sound and we wrap it in wood. And, you know, the guitars, what we do with the guitars, we want it to last forever. And, you know, I think this museum is testament to the fact that if a guitar is well cared for, it can last forever. They need to be played. That's what brings out that, you know, that sound that just improves over time. But we also build them so that they are basically on the verge of self-destruction because that's where the best sound is. The fortunes of the company have ebbed and flowed and I happened to join the business. My father joined the business during the folk boom, which uh, was a great time. You know, Kingston Trio, the Limelighters, the four freshmen played Martin guitars, influenced a lot of well, you know, those of us in the industry call the wannabes. You know, I want to be Bob Shane. Okay, well, I better get a Martin guitar because Bob has a Martin guitar, and then when I play Tom Dooley, I'll sound just like him. And then my father, you know, managed to watch that folk boom transition into the folk rock boom of the 60s. Now, I was talking about this earlier. Um, there's a photograph of my father. My father looked like a beatnik and grew up in the 50s, you know, and, and his thing and the thing that he and his peers did was get together and listen to the Kingston Trio wearing their white tennis sweaters and their, you know, shorts and, and knee socks and penny loafers and they drank beer and smoked cigarettes and listened to folk music. Well, now he's selling to a generation of hippies. And I remember, you know, I didn't grow up here, but I remember coming to visit and I could just tell my father and, and the, his fellow executives weren't quite sure what to make of this hippie movement, but it was okay because they were playing Martin guitars. When I took over, uh, the business had slowed down. In the late 70s and early 80s, musical, you know, as music does, things changed. People's desire to listen to whatever changed. Disco was very popular. Um, the digital sampling keyboard was very popular. And so I found the business struggling when I joined it. And I also found that there, there was a, because my father had made some acquisitions that didn't work out that well, there was a, there was a distraction from a management standpoint. And, and one of the things I said to my colleagues, I said, look, if, if we're not going to make many guitars, let's make sure we still make great guitars. And I think people needed to be reminded of that. When I took over, I was getting a lot of pressure to have a more formal relationship with famous artists. And my feeling was that we, we have always had a great relationship with famous guitar players because they went into a music store and bought our product. I mean, what better endorsement? than to hear that someone like Paul McCartney actually went to a music store to buy his Martin guitar, as opposed to getting it given to him for free because he signed an endorsement deal. And I also thought to myself, I said, being a small company, I don't know if we have the kind of money that would get someone rich and famous excited. I always wanted to see the original D45 that Gene Autry owned. And it turns out it's in his museum in Los Angeles, in Griffith Park. So one day I went, with a friend of mine, and there it was, Gene's Martin guitar. And on the way out, I went in the gift shop, and they were selling all this Gene Autry reproduction memorabilia, lunch boxes and pen knives. And I thought, boy, I'd like to make a reproduction of that guitar. So I came home, and I contacted the woman running the museum at that time, Joanne Hale, introduced myself over the phone, and she said, oh, my husband Monty has a Martin guitar. Well, Monty Hale was one of the singing cowboys. And, she, and I said, I'd like to make a reproduction, give you one of the reproductions, and I'd like to sell some of the reproductions. And what I'd like to do is take some of the proceeds from the reproductions that we sell and make a donation to Gene's museum. She said, hmm, you know, I, I, I think that's a neat idea. Let me call Gene. I'll get back to you. She called me back. She said, yeah, I talked to Gene and his wife. Mrs. Autry wants to talk to you. Okay. So I call. Hello, Mrs. Autry. Yes. Chris Martin. Oh, hello. Gene and I talked. Gene is so thrilled that you want to make a reproduction of his original D45 that he has in the museum, but he thinks you need to give a little more money to the museum. So we did a little horse trading, and what came out of that wasn't only that we made a successful limited edition, but it gave us the template that we use even to this day, and this was 20-some years ago, when we talk to someone famous and say, would you like to partner with us and make an artist model, and we will give part of the proceeds to a charity of your choice. And it, it, every one of them has said, what a great idea. Some of them have private foundations. They all have charities that they're very you know, intimate with and very concerned about. And it's just been a great way to formalize the artist endorsement relationship without it all just being about money. It, 
it's a combination of things. We, want, we have a good design. You know, and I have to thank my ancestors for most of those designs. The, the double O goes way back in our history. The triple O goes way back. The dreadnought came into being in the, in the 1920s. You know, here's a product that's still considered an icon that's, what, 80-some years old now. You know, it doesn't need to be redesigned. We do use the best materials available on Earth. They have to be properly treated. They have to be cured correctly. You can't just buy wood and make a guitar. You have to cure the wood correctly. And then it's the meticulous hand craftsmanship that assures us that they're not all going to sound the same, but they're all going to sound good to somebody. And the Martin guitars have enough of a personality that sometimes people will say, well, I don't know if I like the sound of that one, but this one's a killer. And then sometime later in the day, someone will pick up the guitar that you didn't like and go, man, what a great guitar. It's a very personal thing. I have a young daughter, very young, two and a half. I'm 51. So I do the math in my head and I say, oh, 51, 61, 71, 75, before Claire gets out of college. I want to retire. I want to enjoy that part of my life. So I am beginning now to work with my colleagues on secession planning so that, uh, that they understand that I have a goal to retire in the active day-to-day -day management of the company. I plan to be the chairman of the board forever. And that, who knows if Claire will want to join the business or not, but it's going to be 20-some years before she even has to think about whether that's a decision she wants to make. I bring her into work now. She loves it. She loves going out in the plant. We're watching a guitar being built. She's fascinated by it. When I bring her in, she'll point to the door and go, factory, factory. She's also very therapeutic. You know, people have moods. And as good as we all are and as hard as we work, once in a while, you're not always in a good mood. When I bring Claire in, everybody's in a good mood. Well, there's, you know, the, the theory of business management has evolved. Uh, when I went to college, they were just beginning to teach participative management. You know, it, it is relatively new. Years ago, it was, what, it was called Theory X. Theory X management basically was the boss will tell the worker what to do, and the worker better do it. And that worked for a while, but as the world became more competitive, um, people that study businesses and how they perform and you know, what creates success began to realize that you need absolutely to engage the people who do the work. Because at a high level, I can think I have a good idea, but I don't know if it's really going to be implementable or not. But at the level of where the work is done, first of all, they're doing it all the time, so they're probably thinking about better ways to do it. You've got to bring it out of people. You've got to make them feel comfortable to suggest ways to improve. And more often than not, they're going to have a much better idea of how to improve something than I am. But an individual isn't necessarily going to be able to implement that improvement without the help of others. And we do spend a lot of time trying to create an environment where, you know, what I say to people is, we have competition. It's out there. It's not in here. We should not be competing with ourselves because that's what our competitors hope that we become dysfunctional. Now, when I took over, one of the things that scared me was that I didn't have what I thought was a natural inclination to be a leader. You know, looking back on my career as a student, I was not inclined to be the president of the senior class. Now, all of a sudden, I'm running this operation. They didn't teach me in college. There, I wish, there were two classes I wish they had taught me. One was, so you're going to join your family business. And the other was, so you're going to be the boss. So those were two classes I didn't take. So now I join my family business and I become the boss. And I remember being fascinated by Outward Bound. It was just to watch the National Geographic specials of Outward Bound. And realized through some research that they offer professional development. So I went on a week-long Outward Bound professional development course in Colorado, and it turned me around, gave me the confidence to come back here and say, I believe I can accomplish something significant if I can get everybody else to join me in this vision that I have to, to continue to carry on what my ancestors created. And I have, since that time, gone on Outward Bound with about 250 of the people who work here. We go out for a week. And we practice teamwork. 
And we're, we've gotten so good at it that when we sign up, when we call out Rebound and we say we want to schedule our week in June with Chris, the instructors clamor to join our group because they know we're into it. Because a lot of times when people go on these experiential learning things, particularly at, a, at an executive level, they are drug kicking and screaming into it and they don't want to be there. And in our case, people volunteer to go, so the instructors are like, hey, we don't have to convince them they want to be here. We just have to have fun for a week, and it's, it's really worked out well. And the employees get to know me, and I get to know them beyond just looking at their badge and saying, oh, you're so-and-so. It's like, hey, no, we spent a week in the woods together, remember? I do. I have some concerns about the, the, the materials. You know, we've done a great job of convincing people that rosewood, mahogany, ebony, and spruce make great acoustic guitars. Those materials are getting scarcer. So now we have one of the jobs we have to do is convince people that some other materials will also make great guitars. And then, then we run a little bit into our tradition. People say, well, yeah, that's, that's nice. You have a guitar made out of cherry, but I want the rosewood one. So that's going to be a challenge, is that this kind of re-education about what makes a great guitar. We still have the great design. We still have the meticulous craftsmanship. It just may be, may be that the materials we make the guitar out of are going to be different. I think there are enough people that are committed to this thing that it will carry on and, and it will always be something that people want to know is still here. You know, wouldn't it be a shame if everything on earth becomes kind of genericized? And, it's, and there's no, you can't say, well, one is better than the other. I think inexpensive guitars are a wonderful thing. We do not make inexpensive guitars, but that's what people start with. So I want them to get a good inexpensive guitar. I want them to go to a music store. I want them to go to Guitar Center. I want them to go to Musician's Friend. I don't want them to buy it at a flea market. I don't want them to buy it at a store that doesn't know what a musical instrument is. Because I don't want them to get turned off. I want them to get turned on. Okay, my name is Dale Eckhart. Uh, I've been here for 34 years. And I'm a a worker in a custom shop and I right now I do all the D18 and D28 authentics. I construct all the bodies. Well, when I graduated from high school, I was looking for a job and uh, the one foreman that worked here and I lived behind my mom and dad and I asked him if they were hiring and uh, he said yes so I came in and filled out an application and I was hired on, uh, in August of 1973. So that's how I came to work here. And I've been here ever since. <laughs> I've been told by somebody here that you've done practically every job in the plant. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can uh, basically build a guitar from start to finish. Mm -hmm. How long have you been uh, working in the custom shop? Uh, about a year now. About a year, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm Chris Eckhart. I've worked in the custom shop now for a little over a year. Um, custom shop setup technician. And um, working, I've been working here for about 12 years now. Um, how I got my position. When I first started, I actually started making strings, um, which was kind of a boring job. But, uh, I don't know, it was cool to get into here and just start to be a part of uh, what goes on in the plant. Because uh, I didn't really expect to uh, get as far as I, I have in about 12 years. I um, saw an older fellow start stringing up guitars all day and um, kind of thought to myself, that's, you know, that's really what I wanted to do. So, job position came open. and. Uh, that was about 10 years ago, and I applied for it and kind of got it. And um, I don't know, I've just been uh, trying to do my best with uh, keeping up with uh, any little techniques, you know, inside and outside of here. Um, it's pretty amazing, like, what some of these guitars go for, because I'm surprised for how much they're worth, but I mean, they're amazing pieces. 
What's cool about my position right now is I get to hear these things before anybody else does, and um, they're just, some of them are like cannons right off the bat, and uh, sometimes they don't, some don't sound as, uh, you know, like they project as well, or uh, the tone's not totally there right away, but that's, uh, that's up to the person that's going to be buying the instrument, because when you're going around shopping around, you're finding the one that really, like, it's fine-tuned to you, you know, and then uh, from there, it just grows with you in that respect, you know, but it's cool to get that first playing time on it before anybody else, you know, it, it is cool in that respect. Okay, hi, my name is Milton Hess. I'm a repair technician here at the Martin Company. I've been here almost 38 years. Uh, my uh, father started here back in 1952, and he worked until he retired for 30, about 38 years he worked here. So I started in 1970. I've been here ever since. I started on the line building bodies as a craftsman when I first started. And uh, about 12 or 13 years later, I began doing repair work, and I've been doing repair work ever since. Uh, I'm married, and I have sons, and both my sons work here. They've been here quite a few years already, as time flies by. Uh, I also have a, a daughter-in-law that works here. I have a cousin that works here. My brother worked here at one time in the original sawmill. So they have uh, quite a few family ties here. Uh, name is Heath Huff. Uh, I've been with the company for 13 years. The job title is uh, Wood Utilization Assistant. And I uh, make sure all the wood is being used to its proper capabilities. Run uh, inventory numbers for Mexico for the wood shipments. Keep uh, inventory control of the uh, items that are in the cage. Uh, Brazilian rosewood and uh, high flame koa, Adirondack spruce, Italian alpine spruce. Um, some other oddball species and uh, high dollar value items. The reason I started working at Martin Guitar is my mother is the, was the customer service manager um, here and now she's uh, head of uh, visitors relations and uh, she's been here probably going on 19 years roughly, something like that. And I also have uh, a lot of other family here, cousins and aunts and uncles. So uh, keep it in the family, I guess. Well, my name is Tracy Cox. I'm recently hired here at Martin Guitar to do custom inlay work uh, for the custom shop. And uh, what we do is uh, people will call and request particular designs or ideas, and then we will do the design and all the work we we you know cut the pearl inlay work and do everything pretty much from start to finish right here and uh, right now we're working on a a one-off guitar for uh, Mrs. T's pierogies and we have to actually cut all these eensy weensy little pierogies and make them look like pierogies so that way for position markers we'll use those for the, for the inlay and all I do is I start with gluing the paper patterns to the mother of pearl pieces. And uh, it's pretty basic, rubber cement, glue the patterns. And then with enough magnification and the saw, a jeweler saw, you can cut your patterns and you sort of jigsaw puzzle them together. And then it's just uh, routering the inlay pieces to fit the fingerboards. Here's one here that we've started for another uh, uh, one-off guitar. This is a Chechen fingerboard, and we're going to do like a turquoise inlay for like a southwest theme. And so you just take the pieces, which we have cut, you scribe them onto the fingerboard, and then you just go ahead and you, you cut and make them fit, and you router them, uh, epoxy them in place. Once they're epoxied in place, it's just the finished prep work. You sand it and radius the fingerboard, and you're pretty much that's it. For uh, as beautiful a kind of work as it is, there's really not a lot of fancy work involved. It's all pretty much hands-on, hands at least the one of a custom stuff. You know, there's uh, some pretty high-end CNC machining and stuff, but obviously <laughs> I have a saw, so we don't, we don't do that right here. But that's pretty much the, the gist of it. And uh, like I said, you know, we just do all the, you know, custom order people 
want a particular design or their name or something, and we just go ahead and do it. So and now we're doing pierogies. I started doing the uh, the guitar inlay thing because I've I've always had the passion for instruments, and uh, being artistically inclined for for a long long time. Uh, somewhere along the line, I heard of a, a, a fellow in uh, an area where I lived who uh, was doing the pearl inlay work, and I said, you know what, maybe I can do the guitar enthusiast thing as well as the artistic thing. So we went ahead and uh, he taught me everything I know, and uh, that's from that point on, there was no turning back. It was pearl inlay. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's pretty great stuff. One of the driving forces for me and, and what I try to communicate with my colleagues is that we were very fortunate in that my great, great, great grandfather, C.F. Martin Sr., decided to build great guitars. And he decided to build great guitars every time he built a guitar. I've had the opportunity here in our collection and also in my travels to get a very close, hands-on look at what he did and the craftsmanship is impeccable. I don't think anybody else could have made a better guitar, and I'm pretty confident that nobody else could have made a better guitar as consistently as he did. He achieved a very high form of his craft, and that's the standard. You know, really all we can do is try and maintain that standard. It's difficult to go beyond that because he came very close to perfection. We can lose it, and if you lose it, you know, I don't know if you ever get it back. What we do today is we do it more. We make more great guitars than he did because the demand has grown and the guitar is popular worldwide. And, you know, what a remarkable thing that the guitar, which came out of Mesopotamia, is still popular. And, in fact, it is the most popular musical instrument in the world today. You know, one of, the, one of my running jokes is, and no, no offense, Thank goodness I was not born into the world's most famous accordion-making family. We would be having a different conversation in a much smaller facility. I think my colleagues who work here find it very inspirational to be able to say to themselves and to anybody that asks, I work for a company that makes the best of its kind. I don't work for a company that's making a commodity. I don't work for a company that's making a copy of somebody else's thing that's really good. I work for a company that makes something that is world-renowned as the best example of that thing on earth. My name is Dick Boak. Uh, I run artist relations, publicity, uh, and have had a lot to do with the Martin Museum. The museum was the brainchild of uh, Chris Martin. Uh, we had wanted to do it for a long time, and finally, finally we had the chance, and, and uh, Chris seized upon it, and the results have been uh, fantastic. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of the Martin Guitar Company and the, and the Martin family. And uh, I know Chris Martin will fortify this story himself uh, a little later on. But basically, um, at the age of 15, C.F. Martin Sr. Uh, was uh, interested in woodworking. He had studied in his father's shop in Markneukirchen, Germany, on the border of Poland. And um, at the age of 15, his father sent him off to Austria, Germany, to study in the, in the, in the shop of Johann Stauffer. Stauffer was the, the uh, uh, leading guitar maker of, of his day. The acoustic guitar was just coming into popularity around that time, around, around uh, 18, uh, 1810, 1820. 
And uh, uh, C.F. Martin Sr. did great um, in the Stauffer factory. He rose very quickly to the position of foreman in Stauffer's plant. Eventually, he met uh, his wife-to-be, uh, uh, Ottilie Kuhl, the, the daughter of Carl Kuhl, who was also um, a, an instrument maker. Um, and he decided that he wished to uh, move back to his hometown of Mark Neukirchen, which he did. And he uh, intended to set up a guitar shop in, in his hometown. The problem was that the uh, uh, violin makers uh, that lived in Mark Neukirchen had a very well-established guild. The guild was very much like a labor union, and they didn't uh, wish uh, Martin to set up a shop uh, to make instruments. They considered the guitar to be a piece of furniture and not a viable musical instrument. And so <coughs> a, uh, an argument and eventually a court battle ensued where they tried to prevent him from building guitars. Uh, this left a, a lot of hurt feelings and a bad taste in, in uh, the Martin family. Um, and uh, they eventually, uh, in spite of winning the court case, they eventually decided to uh, leave Germany. Uh, they packed up uh, all of their belongings. And in the fall of 1833, they boarded a boat uh, in England and headed for the new country. Arriving in New York City uh, in uh, what, I, what I think was late October of 1833, they found a, uh, a German-speaking community on Hudson Street near where the mouth of the Holland Tunnel is these days. And they set up shop, uh, bought a building, um, lived upstairs and, and had a storefront uh, at street level. Uh, in the early days, uh, in, in late 1833 and 1834, um, and the first several years, uh, it was more like a music store where uh, you could go in and buy violin strings or you might buy, buy a clarinet or a trombone or a flugelhorn. Most of the instruments were imported from Germany, uh, but it, uh, concurrently, Martin set up his uh, guitar making shop and, and immediately began making some very beautiful and very or ornate guitars, uh, some of which we have on display in the museum here. Uh, the guitars were impeccable in their design and in their uh, level of quality, and he soon uh, took on a, 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 re a very high reputation as being the finest uh, instrument maker in the United States. And so his reputation spread. Uh, the problem was that, that uh, they were quite unhappy in New York City. New York City was a very rough and tumble place uh, with uh, uh, wild animals running in the streets and, and uh, uh, street fights and, and many different uh, uh, conflicting ethnic neighborhoods. <coughs> they almost moved back to Germany. Uh, 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 C.F. Martin's wife, Otilly, was very unhappy. But fortunately, they were able to visit Nazareth. They had friends. They had friends out here in Nazareth. I believe it was a three-day stagecoach ride at the time uh, from New York to Nazareth. And, and uh, we know that she made the trip to visit uh, uh, friends from their hometown of Mark Neukirchen that had emigrated and lived in Nazareth. When she came out here, she found a, a very uh, familiar German-speaking uh, town that reminded her very much of her hometown in Germany. And uh, after her visit, uh, we understand that she went back and read the riot act to her husband. And, and uh, very soon afterwards, uh, uh, he, he gathered all of his inventory and sold it to a firm called Ludicus and Walther in New York City. Sold his inventory of uh, instruments and, and packed everything up and, and uh, moved to Nazareth set up shop uh, just a quarter of a mile up the hill from where we are seated right now uh, in Cherry Hill and that was in the, uh, in the year 1839. Uh, so six years in New York City, moved to Nazareth, set up shop on top of the hill and for a period of 20 years uh, built guitars <coughs> and uh, um, every time they needed to ship an instrument they would have to hook up the horse and buggy and drive down the hill, up the hill, and into town. 
uh, in order to deliver the guitars to the post office. This turned out to be uh, tedious and, and unnecessary, uh, but uh, the problem was that the town of Nazareth was closed, a closed community, a Moravian commune, uh, Moravian being a, a, a German religious sect, and the Martins were not Moravians. Uh, gradually, though, they, uh, they warmed up to the town and, um, and converted to Moravianism. And in 1859, uh, they purchased a, a block of property, uh, a block, uh, one block away from the post office, which made the, the delivery of guitars very easy. Um, there, on the corner of North Street and, and Main Street, they built a uh, homestead. Uh, uh, which is still there. Uh, it's now the Nazareth Chamber of Commerce. Uh, even though Martin still retains the ownership of the building, the building is leased. But that became the, the, the home, and uh, uh, almost immediately they, they began construction of a factory in 1859 next to the home. Uh, the rumor was that guitars were built in the kitchen while the factory was built. Um, uh, and after the factory was completed, uh, um, uh, C.F. Martin Sr. And, and probably one or two helpers uh, from the town uh, uh, got, to, got to work building guitars. And a surprising number of guitars from 1859 uh, through the Spanish-American War, adding employees and specialties and perhaps a, a, la uh, a finishing specialist or a person that was in charge of bending the sides and assembling the bodies, perhaps uh, an office employee um, um, because uh, CF Senior had been in the habit of keeping the journals uh, in the evening uh, by candlelight. <coughs> I'm sure that became quite a job as the business grew. Uh, so CF Martin passed away and his son CF Junior through the Spanish-American War and, and uh, the turn of the century fended off uh, uh, people that tried to take over the business or, or uh, disparage the Martin name or spread rumors to the effect that Martin and Sons was no longer in business. Uh, but he did a good job. He didn't live all that long though and his son Frank Henry Martin at, at a very young age, uh, 17 or 18 or 19 years old, somewhere in, in his late teens, <coughs> was called upon to carry on the business. And uh, he rose to the challenge, um, started building mandolins against the uh, wishes of his distributor. And uh, as a result, he fired his distributor and took on the distri distribution of the guitars um, uh, himself and on a company level. The period of time uh, leading up to World War I and following uh, with the Great Depression uh, Martin Guitar continued to grow in size. Uh, uh, the number of employees perhaps rose to uh, 12, 14, 16, 18 people. And the guitars were impeccable. As a matter of fact, uh, the guitars uh, evolved from very small instruments, uh, uh, size 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, size O, size double O, size triple O growing in size and volume, but maintaining a, a very uh, singular vision of what a guitar should be in terms of its appearance and its tone. Frank Henry Martin uh, ran the business up uh, until around 1940, when his son, C.F. Martin III, uh, uh, took over and, and um, um, uh, maintained the integrity of the guitars. Uh, that was his, his uh, task and challenge. He did a great job at that and ran the company uh, into, his, into, into his 90s. Every day, uh, walking around the plant, knew every uh, employee by name. He was very frugal and very conservative, but uh, as I said, he he maintained the, the uh, dignity and integrity of the, of the uh, guitars. Uh, his son Frank built the, this building and his grandson Chris uh, is currently 
the chairman and CEO, and has uh, the integrity and, and conservatism of his grandfather while maintaining a, a much more open-mindedness to uh, alternative materials, uh, new processes, new technologies. So the company that we have today is a, a very unique blend of tradition and technology. Maintaining the, the designs that were developed by C.F. Martin and his, and his family, but uh, uh, bringing the company competitively into the 21st century. So it's a very special place uh, and a very special product. I always like to say that, that uh, trees, being the sacred things that they are, um, deserve to be utilized for, for uh, very special purposes. And if, you, if trees could talk and if you could ask them what they wanted to be, I, I think they probably would answer a Martin guitar.